Quinn. And Summerby did well to rescue it. Quinn helping it into the path of Nicky Summerby. And this time it's 1 0. More than Grealish, let's just go. <laughs> so you haven't lost your sense of humour, mate. Uh... <laughs>
is absolutely five star. You know, it's boiling hot here all the time, fantastic beaches, uh, light blue sea, white sand. If you want to have a drink, you have a drink. It's not what people are thinking. People aren't driving around with armoured cars. It's nothing like that. You know, it's safe and it's 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 a it's a unique country. It's a fantastic country. They, 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 um, we have a great time. Chris is Chris loves it. We work with Chris all the time. You know, and uh, and he loves it here. We, we we wouldn't go back if we're really honest with you. It's as long as they want us. Yeah, that's pretty much what what I think you've said to me in the past and things like that. And you talk about drinking and things like that. It's funny, <laughs> whenever I've asked Chris to send like a video message to anyone and stuff like, because he's great for stuff like that. You both are. Um, he's always got a glass of wine in his hand. Like no matter what time of the day, it's always a big, and it's never a small glass. It's always like a big glass. Like, oh, he's got his wine again. Fantastic. Um, but you wouldn't change it, would you? Wouldn't change it. So I suppose I'll take you all the way back because we're going to discuss obviously your full career with a big focus on Sunderland because I'm selfish and I want to talk about Sunderland most. But uh, going all the way back, I think probably unbeknown to quite a few people, uh, you had a trial at Man United, didn't you, when you were young? Is that right? Yeah, I was only, uh, when I was at school, uh, there was Eric Harrison, who's obviously good friends with Dad, and I just needed to go train, and they used to train on a Tuesday and a Thursday. This was the boys who were who were the next in line to be apprentices when they finished school, and I started training with them, and it was, it was difficult, it was hard, it, it, it opened my eyes, but I went away, I trained with them for a bit, and I never felt like, I thought, I've got no chance, I just thought that, you know, they're going to get the best players in the world, if you like to go there and I just didn't go back and there, there were there were there was a lot of well, especially Eric Harrison he said to dad he said why did he never go back and I just didn't fit I just thought it was I wouldn't stand a chance and possibly didn't have it didn't have a lot of confidence at that time so mm-hmm. uh, but yeah but the experience was good I went on trial to Manchester City as well the youth facility the youth what they had then at Manchester City was was probably better than Manchester United they were bringing yeah. players from everywhere and that I thought I was the centre forward. I always thought I, don't, I just thought I was a centre forward, and I, and I kept trying to persist with that. And it wasn't the case till further down the line. Glenn Oddle, who was manager at Swindon, where the first club I went to, is he was. He, he, I managed to speak to him because he comes over here doing work, and he and he said, "I don't know where I'm going to play that that, that lad next to me. I don't know where." I said, "Just get out there and just cross a few balls. Just go out there." And, and that was it. I went out there and crossed a few balls, and I think he thought, "Well, hang on a minute." Just from saying that, me thinking I was a centre forward, to him saying, "What, what should we do with him? Should we there just get him out there?" And that was it. And all of a sudden, I started crossing a few balls, and that was me playing on the right hand side. How did the the move to Swindon come about originally? Because was it nineteen eighty nine when you very first went there? It was. Yeah, I'll tell you what was unique about it. It was the day of, there was a thing that there was a Hungerford disaster when a fellow went through this small town shooting everything all because we played the game and was going to London after. And that's when the police was. I know it's not a relative, but. Uh, what it was there is dad started from there and, the, and the, the, it, it, dad's dad died a, a long time ago and there's a man called Cecil Green who pretty much was like dad's dad uh, and he just said look he said why didn't Nick come down there was a trial there and it was against Cardiff City and I, I was getting to the point where everybody was going to be apprentices school was finishing I had to try and get in so whoever said there was a trial I went to Leicester City did everything what I could do there didn't get in there uh, and then all of a sudden Swindon, I went down there and it managed, it was very complicated at the start, but they offered me they offered me a trial and then eventually I managed to get my two-year apprenticeship then, which was a massive learning curve, to be honest with you. Would it have been Lou Macquarie at that point then? Is that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what was he Lou like? Macquarie. Well, he was a runner. He was just, they, they weren't, it wasn't very much on the training pitch. This was just, we were out on the streets running and we were running around the, around the pitch, using it a lot with all medicine balls and all that. He was just, he, that was his style, but he got success and got them out of the, out of the divisions down there. But uh, he, he eventually took them to Wembley where they played, well, it was Sunderland. It was Sunderland where Adam McLaughlin scored the goal there. Sure, it was, sure it was that then. So they, they nearly got there, but... They got demoted because of irregular irregular payments. Someone had betted on something or whatever, and you know, and that that was that. So, it's typical football stories, really. But Lou McCarthy yeah. still, you know, legend, really. You know, but to have him, especially going to a football club and, and and have him as your manager, I wasn't really with him because I was with the youth team. 
It's funny you mentioned that Swindon game. It totally went out of my mind that that was 1990, probably one of the worst Sunderland performances at Wembley, yet we still got promoted despite getting beat. Kind of goes over your head. I mean, I was really young, but obviously it's because of the story. You just remember it, don't you? It's a, me- a memorable story. Well, I was in the squad, I was in the squad, but not really. I had no chance of playing at all. But I remember obviously Gabardini. Gabardini was the he was the he was the man, wasn't he? And the, and the way yeah. he was built and how strong he was, and you know, big reputation going into that game. He thought, well, we have to stop this guy. And you know, I think it was a guy, Alan McLaughlin, uh, uh, got the goal. But yeah, it wasn't it wasn't to be. Was that the boy you ended up playing for, uh, Pompey, Irish lad? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, Nor- and not Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland as well. So yeah, I thought it was. There. You talked about Glenn Hoddle before. Unfortunately, as it was, you know, Glenn sort of did leave for Chelsea, I think it was in 93. But when you, you sort of played under Glenn Hoddle, which was probably when you really started getting into the team at Swindon, there's plenty of players that have like really rated his managerial style. And a lot of the time you hear people and pundits and former players saying, you know, Glenn Hoddle for that job, whichever it may be. A lot of them high profile, but it's never really come to fruition. But what did you make him of as a manager? No, he's fantastic. Uh, very good. I think he was one of the. He was uh, he was successful with England as well until yeah, he, he was. departed for, 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 for different reasons. But what people don't realise with him is he was he finished his career at Monaco, where Arsene Wenger was there. So Arsene Wenger obviously is with his with his style of, of managing. He brought all that back, which was totally strange in England. You know, all this style with the training was different. He was still playing when he came to Swindon, which was fantastic. He was going to play as a sweeper. And I was lucky because I was up. I, I couldn't play as a winger. I had to play as, as a wing back. So, obviously, the three at the back. So, I'm expected to be a winger as well as a full back. Uh, and he was just playing as as as, as the sweep and imagine his passing and and to have someone like that. And I remember one of my first one of my first. I was in a reserve team game and he kept spraying the ball out to the left hand side. You know that wonderful passing what he had. So yeah. I thought, well, I'll show I show him a bit keen here. So I said, hey. I said, what about me? I said, well, you keep spraying the ball out there. He said, don't just stand there and look at me. Make a run. So I thought, flash back, but I'll show you. So I got the ball, give it to him, and just went off on a run, right? Thinking, well, can you get it? Come on. I'm telling you, it came over here like that. <laughs> Unbelievable, like, couldn't believe it. Miscontrolled it, fell over it or whatever. It was like that. Whoa. Well, I was up against I was up against a guy called Dave Kerslake who went on to play at Tottenham. Uh, he was at QPR a long time ago and a good player. But he went on to Tottenham and that gave me the opportunity to play and obviously getting into the team, playing on a regular basis with Glenn Hoddle, and we had success because we went through to the playoffs and we, and we and in a fantastic game. If you ever get the chance to see it against Leicester City, all my friends are there uh, just at the just at the side of where all the uh, where all the dugouts are and they're all there we go 1-0 up 2-0 up 3-0 up I'm like Whoa, I'm giving it out to the old Paul Merson one I'm like come on here we go we've done it 3-1 second half 3-2 3-3 my arse has got I think it's gone it's from enjoy from just totally gone right then all of a sudden we have a guy Chalky White who comes on and we get a little bit of a dodgy penalty and luckily we managed to get through but tell you what what, what a day that was and we eventually did it and obviously Glenn Hoddle was there but when, when we when we collected the trophy after Ken Bates who was the chairman of Chelsea was in the background there and he he went to he went to Chelsea after that yeah he went to Chelsea in I think summer in 93 wasn't it something like that was it John Gorman that got the job the assistant I think it was at the time mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Yeah, uh, we we were never really good enough, but uh, it was it was. What we realised is obviously when you go up to the Premier League, you make those little bits of mistakes and you get punished straight away, and it's it's another level. But enjoyed it, you know. From where it, you need you need that little bit of luck, you need that little bit of of just being able to get in there. My luck was Dave Kerslake going. and then all of a sudden, then then my chance came. The next minute, I was playing in the Premier League and. When you do go up, nobody knows you. So you, you, you're fearless you, and you just express yourself and you're up against the best and you, you're just buzzing from it. You know, it's, it's that proper atmospheres and big games and you just think, well, here we go, this is... And you just love it because there is no negative. When you're young and you come into a side, you, just, you are literally fearless. You just, you're not bothered. You just get out there and you express yourself. You don't have any negative, you say. Further down your career, you can get the negative. You can get your setbacks. And that's when it seems to affect you a little bit more. 
When it comes to Swindon, obviously, as it was, you got relegated that year and it was probably quite similar to a couple of the Sunderland teams sort of a decade or so later. But as it was, you got recognised um, and you went on to, to Man City. Now, obviously, you're a City fan. Um, I heard a rumour somewhere someone said you're a United fan, but you're not. You're, you're City through and through, as far as I'm aware. Um, obviously, your dad's hugely popular at City. Um, and I think you've heard a few players say similar stuff like uh, like Jordi Croy, for example, when you've got like a really famous dad, he felt like he was kind of living up to that. And as it was, does it add pressure for yourself going to a club like City? Because obviously you want to play for City, but does it add pressure because of how well your dad did? It was comparisons, which you have all the time. You know, everybody as a successful father is all the way through their life is, is the comparisons. People, all, you always have that. That's what it is. But I had a chance. Brian Robson had just gone to manager at Middlesbrough and Viv Anderson, and they did everything, everything in the power to, to, to get me up there, showing me what the new stadium was going to be like. They're going to bring big players in and all this, which they did do with the Ravinellis and the, and the likes of that. And I didn't want to do that, you know. For me, I was a man. I'm a Manchester lad, and to play in Manchester derbies and and to and to try and be better than Dad, you know. If I had that chance, if I had that choice again, I'd do the same thing. But it was difficult because it was things weren't going so well. Manchester City obviously is a different football club now, but then yeah. the fans thought they was as good as Manchester United, and they were. They were Manchester United were far superior. At, at, the, at that time, and it was difficult because their expectation levels were were very high. Were very high. We had good players. We managed to stay up after the after the first season, but then got rid of a lot of the players. Got rid of the Quinnies. Got rid of the got, got rid of the uh, Gary Flickcross, Keith Curls, Terry Feelings, and all of a sudden it was really difficult again. And that's when we went down the year after that. Uh, and after that, it was. It was it was tough because teams were coming to Main Road and they were raising the game and it, it was it, you had to go up another level and we thought in our minds that we were Premier League players and it's not the case once you once once you go down but would I have done it again now Yes I would do but when Sunderland came along that was that was the perfect time for me it, I was I was an acquired taste. Because if you looked at me, I always wore big shorts. I, 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 I ran gangly. You go, he's a bit lazy and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't really, it wasn't really a case of that. And, event, and the City fans never really got on to my, what I was good at is across the ball. And eventually, Sunderland did. And it was a fresh start for me going to Sunderland and the perfect time for me to go to Sunderland. With uh, City, I think they changed manager as well, didn't they? They went from Horton to, was it Alan Ball? Oh, was what? So when I went there, it was Brian Horton. No, so then it was Alan Ball, Frank Clark. In between that was Phil, Phil Neal. Uh, Steve Coppel came. He went. But eventually then Frank Clark came and I just signed a three-year deal. When I got the phone call, which was... I mean, I was having a bad time with the City fans. It, it, they just weren't having me and not at all. It was difficult. I used to start every game and it was, they were booing me, saying, number seven, Nixon will be boo! And all this, I had a right bit of a bad time with them. I told them once I was in the corner, which wasn't very clever. I was trying to do something. A few of these guys were having to go right where the kid back is. So I turned around and went, piff, piss myself. And it went everywhere in the ground, in the boxes. So every game after that, they just weren't having me at all. And when I got the phone call to say they wanted to do the swap, uh, the swap deal with Craig Russell, yes. They wanted, Craig, they wanted Craig Russell, so it was a case of could I do the deal as well, go to Sunderland. And having just played the opening game, uh, where, where some have played Man City in the opening game and looking at the stadium, looking at everything, thinking, hang on a minute, this is oh, this is this is fantastic. And all of a sudden, this, this opportunity came and Craig Russell didn't understand what it was like going to Manchester City. Yeah, It was a different football club and it was an awful feeling. And that's why it went down a couple of divisions. You know, it was tough times for them. For me to get out and then go to a new club, you know, obviously with, with, with the players there, with Peter Reid there, with Quinney there, it was the right time. It was it was a bit a much better move for me. My first game was Portsmouth. Oh, Pompey, and you scored. That's right. You got the fourth one, wasn't oh, yeah. it? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I think as it was, I, that was we were going through a difficult period. I think when you first came in, but that kind of kick started everything. That Portsmouth was, if I remember right, there was a couple of wins in and out, but a couple of draws, a couple of defeats. I think we lost at Redden just before you came in. What was it about? Sunderland that sort of changed from because from there onwards we were just almost unbeatable. What was it that changed the the atmosphere when you walked in? I, I just know a really I just know it's a really good team spirit. 
good lads in there, good honest lads, and and it was it was a lot better team spirit than what it was when it when when I come from City because it was difficult there, you know. And he's I had to I think Bobby Saxon said, look, you have to get your career going. And uh, it, it's it pretty it pretty much stagnated a little bit at City, so you've got to you've got to prove your worth there. And it was a fresh start for me though. And what is the ingredients for success? Listen, it's people will pay anything for it, but whatever that ingredients was, it was it, these lads gelled. These lads worked well, and we worked well off the pitch as well. We used to all go out together as well. It was it was very much encouraged by Peter Reid. Uh, but but the main crux of it, which you'd have to say, is having a leader in there, having someone that gets hold of you and say that was poorly. You know, I never came across a captain who was so organised, but did it in a in a in a good way. You wouldn't get on the wrong side of him, uh, but he was organised and he got a grip of everything. And you thought, and he's in the centre of the park there. And you thought, well, I've got a minute, you know. And the, he's the main crux crux of it there, and all the rest of the players just yelled. It worked, you know, for me. You know, I couldn't really beat a player, but I could open my body up and I can whip a ball into the box. Now, if you've got Niall Quinn, if you're, if you're going to whip it across the near post or and you get too much height on it, Niall Quinn is always going to be getting on the far post because you've got the small and the big. If you're in trouble, you can hang it up because Quinn is there. You know, and that was for me is once people understood the way I was, I mean, you had, you had Johnson on the other side, a lot more trickery, could cut inside, go on the outside. No, mine was a lot more for a centre forward. Was was perfect for him because they knew. Hang on, he opens his body up here now. I'm making my run now. You know, do you remember again? Remember the guy uh, Peter B. Greaves at City? Absolutely, absolutely. Very very and similar then, setup, wasn't it? Now he would have been a de- now he would have been a disaster for a centre forward because he turns one way, turns the other way, turns one way, and you, you can't make your run. You know what I mean? What I'm yeah. saying, great is what it is to the eye, and you watch it, but then all of a sudden with me, I just. Uh, I just got into this routine, just getting the ball out of my feet. Chris, whoever's behind me, give me the ball early and just whipping it in there, you know, and it, and, and it worked for me. And people, people started to understand that it, you know, you get your momentum. Football's all about confidence as well. You know, you start believing. And when you've got a set of lads who you, who you really are, I'm talking about everybody going out on a night out, everyone having the crack, going into the dressing room every day, people taking the piss out of you. Which, when you do finish football, is what you miss more than anything. Yeah. You know, sometimes you get a new pair of trainers or something. You get a new pair of trainers sometimes and you think, I don't think I've got the battle to wear them. I said, I'll get a right load of stick if I go in that dress. And you just know, and it, you know, and it was all this and the banter. And that's what it was there. And it grew and it grew. With um, the team as it was, you mentioned Beagree before. And it's funny because I think Johnson's quite similar but Johnson probably got Johnson looked like he did more than he actually did I think he was just quite good at like mesmerizing people by not knowing which way he was going to go because he could play with both feet but I think the big thing that I remember from that is the partnership that you had with Chris Macon and also the partnership that was almost telepathic the one Mickey Gray and, and John O had but when you're looking at the way we played at that point it's a little bit more commonplace now that the the wingers overlap but we were a little bit ahead of our time at that point. Or really, of the team as itself were a little bit ahead of its time because the way our fullbacks used to bomb on, no other team was really doing that in the division at the time. Whether was that something that you planned to do, or was it something that came naturally? No, uh, Mickey and Jono. That that was more them because Mickey's energy. He loved to go for, and Jono could go inside, and then Mickey can go on the outside. Chris Macon was told not to go past the halfway line. I said, "Your <laughs> job is." I said, your job is you're, you've crunching everything because that's yeah. what he loves. He's a defender. You know, that's his game. You speak to Ryan Giggs and say, who's one of the tough defenders? It's Chris because he steps all over. He's aggressive. And that was perfect. I used to say to him, there's two coming now. What are you going to do with it? And I just used to stay there. And as soon as he got the ball, he just gave him the ball. So we, we simplified it a lot more. You know, sometimes every now and then I'd cut inside and Chris would try and go on the outside and I'd do my usual and blank him, which he still, which he always <laughs> He'd run 40 yards going, get swipe me in. And I'd go, no chance. And then he'd, he'd obviously do his thing where he had one shot a game, which was an absolute disaster. He used to cut inside and he used to think, I can't believe he's going for it again. And just used to let that one, that foot go, and it went nowhere near the goal. But, you know, that's, that's how it worked for us. It was, uh, I, I didn't have to do any defending. You know, so that's so, yeah. so my job. My job was getting the ball past the halfway line. That was it then. So I'm working on. I'm working on half a pitch. I'm not running when I was at Swindon, going back, wondering, wondering about defending, then trying to get down the other end. You know, my my main concern was just putting crosses into the box. And I know. And by wasn't... the way, we, by the way, we were better than we were better than 
that Gray and Johnson. Not having that at all. <laughs> Not having that at all. Me and Chris, it's just simple. Simple game of football. They're running around, going backwards and sideways and doing all little twists and turns. And we're just simple on that right side. Rock hard as well. Well, I grew up in the, the era of like John Kay, so the likes of Chris Macon just buying them from you know, the DNA of what I like as a football fan. You see that winger there, just belting one. I remember David yeah. Ginola yeah. coming to the stadium, I like, and I remember everyone saying, oh, Ginola this, Ginola that. And I remember it was like a 10, 11 year old going, ah, Chris Macon will have him. And my dad's going, oh, he's a good player, you know, that Ginola. And I remember he got took off at half time because Chris just belted him into touch every time he got the ball. It was like, as soon as he got one touch straight into him. Great. But that's why you love that. You know, you couldn't do that. I don't. I don't. You couldn't do that so much now. You know, Chris no. was first and foremost. If I think we lose it a little bit in the modern day football, you want a defender to be a defender. But obviously now, I don't think there's wingers around now. If I was a winger now, and I would have to go in in field, and then obviously the fullback is like the winger that goes on the outside. So I'd be unemployed. Now the me and Chris would be unemployed. Now we couldn't get couldn't get a game now. I think you'd get in the Sunderland team now. No offense to the lads currently playing, but I think you might. Um, Talking about like social circles and stuff like that, I think it's really well documented that it was a really good social circle and a really good bunch of lads there. And the fact that pretty much all of you still speak to each other speaks absolute volumes. But one thing that always intrigued me looking back, um, and he's really well liked as someone, Lionel Perez just seems like the complete different kind of person and character to the rest of that squad at the time. Was Lionel as different as he seemed or was he actually just one of the lads as well? He was crackers, but uh, good crackers. He was a he was a personality, wasn't he? As you could see, how he was as a goalkeeper, erratic, uh, aggressive, you know. And I liked him, but he was just he's from a different country, and he was he had his own style, which 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 he did. But when he went out or came out with us and all was around the dressing room, you know, he was he was a proper character. I don't think we'd have got on the wrong side of him. By the way, when we when when we did we got beat by Charlton. I mean, what's the worst? It's happened, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we just got stuck into drinks on the back of the bus on the way home. Me, him. There was, there was Michael Pollitt who came, who went on to be the goalkeeper at Wigan and all this type of stuff. Used to be, used to be United. And we just went for it. And we, we just got stuck into it. And we had an absolute great time. We ended up in some house, in Newcastle somewhere or whatever. And yeah, that's all you could do. And he was, he was, he was a character, you know, and he was... Uh, he was like a Cantona type of a character, saying that arrogance. You know, he was. But when he was when he was trained and when he was around the club, you would have never gotten on the wrong side of him. He was a very professional man, you know. And yeah, I like people who are a little bit different. Different. I like that. I like that little bit of an edge, and he had that. With them, um, the social circle as it was, I think it's a bit different now with social media, and I think. The more players I speak to from the mid '90s ago, oh, thank God it didn't exist in the world of like Twitter and Instagram and stuff like that, because I'd, I'd be destroyed. But how much do you think, as, as talented as the team was, how much do you think the team thrived on having that really good social circle where you all kind of had each other's back, basically? Yeah, that was all part of it. Uh, listen, there's a lot of money around nowadays in football, but I, I would still prefer the times when we we could go out. You know, we could have a little bit of fun and you have to have that. And we're not talking about going out all the time. You know, this was encouraged by the manager and it and in it worked at Sunderland. You know, it, uh, it we all thought so much of each other and that went out onto the pitch. It was on and off the pitch. It was so much of a tight unit. I thought he got broke up a lot too uh, a lot too early. You know, I thought there was a lot of there was a lot of football left in us, a lot of good and it, and it proves that. Probably not so much with me because my career pretty much uh, went downhill after that. I had more and I wanted to do more and I felt there was more in there. I mean, I was going out on football grounds so confident and having the fans behind you and everything going right for you. You know, but I just, I, I think I think they split it up too early. That Look at Alex Ray went on, did did really well. Mickey obviously went on. All these players what went on and, 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 and carried on playing at the high level. Chris as well. You know, we went and played in Europe with, with Ipswich. You know, we had a fantastic levels. A lot of these players went on, so I don't see the point. It, 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 they weren't guys who were coming to the end. There, there, there was two, three years. I just thought that the signings, what they should have got, should have pushed us. So these signings, what come in, they've still got a fight to get in. And, you know, keep pushing it and try and get as much out of it. And I just thought they split it up a, a lot too early. I mean, I got replaced by Kevin Kilban. No disrespect to Kevin Kilban, but... I just, yeah, I was like, ah, what? He's dancing on ice or whatever he's doing now, isn't it? Like that is a mega step. Like, ah. He couldn't cross the road. But then, you know, but there was a, 
that, that was it. Peter Reed wanted me out. I remember, I remember how bad it got. Is I mean, I made a few bad choices as well by not turn, turning up at the training ground. But that was me a little bit too confident. You know, you, you're only, you're only. It's all football's all about egos. You can't walk around and being a little shell. You've got to give it big. So why do you see footballers driving big, stupid cars? And well, I did all that. You know, you sometimes you're portraying confidence and you get a bit silly and it's just, you know, you get brought down a little bit, you know, and it was just, uh, you know, it was just some bad choices, but it was, went horribly wrong for me. And I remember we, I went to Old Trafford where some of them were playing Old Trafford and they played Mickey Graham on the right wing and there couldn't have been any more of an insult, really, you know what I mean? And I never got, I never really got offered another contract, which I thought was strange. So I did me three years and and, and that was it. So... But there was it was a great team that, and you'd always you'd always say, "What if? What what about if we could have just kept them together a little bit longer?" Talking about like chemistry off the pitch, I think one of the big things I noticed was there was a lot of chemistry on the pitch, of course. And one of the big ones for me, people look at you know Johnston and Gray, you and and Chris Macon, but it was sort of you and Quinny as well. Like I don't know if we've just got like rosy memories, but it, it often seemed like every cross that you put in would reach Quinny. And if Quinny didn't put it in, then Phillips would get the rebound or vice versa. But how much did it help playing with Quinny beforehand at Man City when you moved to Sunderland? Did you just know his game inside out and that's why it just almost clicked immediately? Yeah, it's that as well. But the size of him, you could hit him. <laughs> Anyone could bloody hit him. He's that bloody big. He's an option. I mean, you, but the thing is with Quinny is that he's fantastic at peeling on defenders. Yeah. How, many, how many times do you see the goals on the far post where all of a sudden he managed to get that yard or so and then eventually he's one on one with a keeper? That's what Quinny was good at. So when you're cutting in field there, he knows he's just peeling on that far post. And if he can't bring it down, he'll knock it down, he'll knock it either back into midfield or down for, for, for Kevin Phillips. And, you know, it did help that I worked with him, but. The flip side as well is it's not rocket science. You know, when you do cut inside and you see a guy there who's six foot something, it shouldn't be hard just to chip it up on his head or onto his body. It's the perfect, it's the it's the perfect, it's the big fella and the small fella, you know? That was the best, best partnership of my lifetime, without a doubt. I'm not sure if you remember this, but I heard a fantastic story uh, about Quinny. And it was told to me by Kevin Phillips, I think. I think you were in Marbella at the time because you were in Marbella a lot, weren't you? I think Quinny or the, the lads had spotted this Irish bar and they had like a Guinness drinking challenge where if you could drink like... No, no, I know what you're going to say, yeah. No, this was, we'd end up going, we'd end up going to Bournemouth for some reason. I think we were playing, I'll tell you what, we might have been playing Southampton or whatever. We yeah. stayed down there. So they said you can go out on a Saturday night, uh, don't go out on a Sunday. Well, everyone's obviously had a few drinks. That was it. It was, it was Quinny, Ordy. I think Mickey Gray was a useless lightweight. What he is slumped up in some corner somewhere, but he'd done about what he'd done. He'd done about thirty odd pints or something, or twenty, like, and he was not a problem. I mean, yeah. Quinny, okay, he'd have a drink, but every now and then, it, when he really went for it, it's hollow legs. You don't mess about with him. That's serious stuff. That he was just poof, different. Is now is that st- is that the story? Or is that another yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the exact one. Apparently, he he went out. I think I think the challenge was twenty pints of Guinness in like a. a a space of about four hours or something. Well, he, he well churned past twenty five. He was fine. He was he was not a problem. Don't worry, it's none of that with him. It's hollow legs, isn't it? He just carried on. He was just, <laughs> what he does, he t- what he does, he takes a sip out of it, a healthy sip, and then the one after that, he's just like, "See you later, good night, off we go." Was he the best drinker? <laughs> and Mick, he, 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 on his day, if you if you get Quinny, you've got to be on. You've got to be. That's it. He's serious. when he's ready for it. You know, he's, uh, yeah, good fun, but he just goes for it. And it's his sense of humour and all that type of stuff and he's dancing. We went to Cork once when we, was, when we were at City. I think, was it Cork? It's Cork where Roy Keane's from. Anyway, we ended up going back to this this old housing estate and he's singing uh, Rhinestone Cowboy, right? <laughs> in this people's house. Oh, he, Working the streets, so we're all banging the walls and all that. <laughs> I think Roy Keane, but Roy Keane was... That was where he's from. He's having next door neighbour, his family. So when he's gone back to Manchester, he's gone, hey. he said, what were you doing the other weekend? And all that in Cork and all that, in where I live and all that, lot like singing Rhinestone Cowboy. <laughs> and that was it, couldn't he? Just loved to sing song, a bit of a laugh. And, you know, when he got the flavour, he, he, he loved it. And I suppose it's one of those things as well, whereas footballers these days, especially the young lads, like the likes, the like of, you know, Jack Grealish, for example, made quite a few different mistakes but I remember when he was really young and he was like 18, 19 and he was like basically like blacked out in the middle of the street and stuff like that it's a, probably a bit of a shame that the 18, 19 year olds now 
who have all that money and have all that temptation can't be allowed to make those mistakes almost. And and I think as a human, you've got to make those mistakes, don't you? It's not just as a footballer. You've, I, geez, when I was 17, 18, as many times I've gone and got blackout drunk and I, I quickly realized that that wasn't for me. I was the Mickey yeah. Gray of my, my friendship group, shall we say. Um, yeah. couldn't, couldn't take too many pints, but you have to learn from those mistakes, don't you? And it's almost like in football, if you're a good player and you're a teenager or early 20s, you, you can't make those mistakes now. It's almost like you've got nothing to learn from because you're so terrified of making the original mistake because of how you'll be vilified, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, it's about you want that bit of rawness at the start. You know, you want that little bit of, you, you know, you want a little bit of a naughty lad. You know, that means he's got a bit of character, he's got a bit of something. But you just, it's the it's very difficult because you'll get recorded and you'll get you get yourself in trouble. You look at the boy Grealish, who was, who, was, who was back to his best, talking about maybe big moves to United and, and, and England. He just goes out and has a stupid night. But it has happened before, you know. And it's, you do have to realise they are young. But hey, now, they are athletes, these boys now, aren't they? Yeah. You, have to, you, have to, you have to be running the certain mileage, kilometres or whatever per first hour. They're monitored in training, monitored on the pitch. You can't cut any corners. You can't have a bit of a night out and think, well, I'm going to take it easy in training. It's not that way now. They've got to keep producing it, you know. It's, it's, it's different. But I'd have the old days, mate. Oh, going out and all that, we used to have some, some great times. And that's where you, you learn. But, you know, I suppose things, things move on. I mean, for me... You know, going in that dressing room, having that banter, you know, then going out, if you get a victory on the Saturday, then you go out and have a good time and all that lot. And, you know, it's, it's all part of it. All, you know, you have some wonderful times playing football, but it's not just on the pitch, which is, which is obviously the best. It's all the rest of the people you meet, and the camaraderie and all that lot and going out and blah, blah, blah. It's, it, you know, you miss that and going in the dressing room and that's it. That's the fun. I would imagine they still have that now, but they have to be careful going out. We didn't. I think one of the, probably one of the big, big things that I can take out from that, I was talking to, to Lee Clark uh, last week, I think it was, and we touched on when Alex Ray actually had to take a bit of time out of the game for his sort of drinking problems and stuff like that. And I said, you know, that team was was really well known for having a good social circle. I could go and sink a few pints together and kind of shoot the shit, basically. Um, but what was it like when Alice came back when, you know, he had those drinking problems? How did you address that? And he was saying, you know what, at that point, we had a bit of a laugh and Bobby Saxon filled his, uh, I think he filled his, like, his locker with, like, whiskey and all sorts of stuff for a laugh. But he said, essentially, you know, we all got around him. He was like our mate and everyone in that squad, like, had his back. And I suppose that's probably the best way to look at what that was like. Yeah, there was Mickey taken and, yeah, there was good social nights and there was some states that you would have been in. But essentially, that attitude you have, off, like, off the pitch of looking after each other was the same attitude you had on the pitch that you'd look, at, look after each other as well. And I think that's what created those results and that team spirit and that bond and that successful time, wasn't it? Yeah, it did, yeah. First and foremost, Alex doesn't need a drink. <laughs> Alex is crackers anyway. So, <laughs> he, he, with a drink, without it, it doesn't matter. But when he came back, we, we joked about, and I think we put some lines of uh, uh, flour down and a couple of pints, and did all the welcome back to his thing. And it doesn't make no difference with him because he's, you know, he's just got a great character. And he just, it was as if, it was never a problem with Alex. And he's never touched a drop since, but goes out still with the lads and all that lot and goes to places. We, we, were, we were doing this five-a-side football tournament and I asked him to go. Same sense of humour, sharp as anything. You know, and he's, uh, he, he, was, he, was, he was a perfect character to come through it, if you understand what I mean with that. Yeah. Because he, he, he's, he's, a, he's a really big character, Alex. And it's great to see what he's doing, you know. He's getting into media now. He's been doing his coaching and all that lot as well. You know, he, I think he was with Paul Ince on, on a couple of his, uh, I think he was his sidekick when he's at Wimbledon and the likes of that. And he's a, he's a, he's a good lad, Alex Ray. Another player who, who was a big part of our, of our team spirit of, of the club. But it, his partying days came well before that. Because I started up at Swindon, I used to play in the youth team and he was Millwall. And you look at some of those old players there, and I think Sheridan was there. There were so many real big party guys there. And he was obviously in that London scene, in with all them. So when he came to Sunderland, that's when he'd, he'd probably been doing 10 years or whatever of going out and really enjoying himself. And I think he just came to a head for him. But he's never looked back, back Alex. He's, he, he don't need a drink. Waste yeah. of time with him. What a guy. What a, what a fantastic guy. Yeah, I say it, I say it every single every interview I do where Alex Ray comes up, I absolutely love him. It's almost sometimes when I meet him, 
I kind of don't want to because I make myself cringe, but he makes me laugh with everything he says. Yeah, but he used to he used to play he used to play cards on every trip we were going. So you'd have Bobby Sass and Quinny himself, and maybe Audi or or, or or someone else. And the thing is with him, he used to he used to go he used to little spits like that, not spitting himself, but just like a nervous thing. You knew straight away if he had a good card. Straight away, he spit him like anything. You go, Alex has got a good card. He's up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh great yeah oh brilliant yeah oh, great yeah, yeah good lad we used, we used to work before he'd before he'd, he'd come to a head with it and he had to go in the AA and all that I used to be, I used to room with him and he was in the bunk bed below him and he was like you English bastard well, yeah get out of it you English bastard all this time I'm going shut up you silly Scottish brittle and he was just at me all the time and yeah good fun though great, great lad he is Alex great player as well fantastic player one of the best that's probably been in the squad in my lifetime anyway. We have to touch on it a little bit. Um, obviously, things worked out, but playoff final, probably the most exhausting game, if not the best game that many Sunderland fans have witnessed. You scored, obviously, the fourth one. What's it like scoring at Wembley? Well, we, I think the first half was a disaster, wasn't it? Because we, yeah. we, we'd, fin- we'd finished quite a few points ahead of them. And we just thought we literally we just have to turn up there. And it wasn't the case. It was going horribly wrong. I was never in the game. I, w- I was struggling. That's why I've had to try and find the ball in mid. It had to come through midfield, but all of a sudden, to for that ball just to bounce up where it was there, and for me to hit it is a dream. It's a dream to, to to play at Wembley and obviously to score at Wembley. And we thought we managed to get a grip of it. We thought, hang on a minute, we you know we managed to show the quality, get the goals, get back into it. But then all of a sudden, it just kept going horribly wrong, didn't it? You know, and I, I think I think Perez tries to come out. I think. Is it when Rufus has scored the goal yeah, to, to make it level at the end? He, he tries to come out. And we weren't far away, I don't think, from the whistle Six to, minutes. to finish then. Six minutes, yeah. And it, yeah. it was just this. We've got this. Uh, the, the, the way in which I look at it, if we hadn't been successful the year after, you would look at it awfully. But we got in the dressing room after, and I think it was Quinny, and he said, come on, let's get it this, second, this next year. Let's do something. You've got to turn it into a positive somehow or other. You know, and that's what we did. I mean, that was our driving force the next year. That was what made everything go right for us. So as bad as what it was and a nightmare as what it was to be a part of it, because I've been to Wembley winning and been to, been, to, been to Wembley losing and you don't want to leave there losing. It's awful. But it's what we did the year after. We put it straight and we made it right the, the year after. That's, what, that's, why, that's why I don't look at it so badly. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's funny when you say about Quinny, I remember he came on the TV on Sky Sports and he, he was dead, like determined and he said, oh, we're going to go into next season and we're going to go unbeaten. I thought, bloody hell, unbeaten. And we only <laughs> ended up losing three games, I think it was. And we went like 24 games unbeaten or something like yeah. that. But it was, there, there was an element of that where you felt like we, we could potentially go on and do that. And we were, we were bloody close, weren't we, the season after? I mean, three defeats, was it? Something like that? Yeah, it, it... It was just straight away, we hit it good. And the fans realised straight away. We thought, hang on a minute, this could be a good one, this. And it was, you know, everything worked out. And do you know what? We possibly could have gone up against Charlton and maybe we would have got relegated the year after. We had that determination. We, we proved that we had that fight back. You know, and, and everything, what Quinny was saying at, at the time, he was probably thinking, shut up, it's a wrong time. But we did something about it. And that was our driving force. And that, that, that's where it worked. That, and that's where those important players, which are there, you know, that's where you bought, that's where you, that's where you, uh, you, your Quinny is. You know, that's those, you don't, don't forget, Andy Melville was playing at the back then. You had Butts, what came in, Andy Melville went. You know, some of these players, we had some strong players there. So, you know, we were, that was our driving force, that, and we, that eradicated everything. And we take the piss out of Mickey, and I still do now. You know, I keep in contact with Mickey all the time, though, but that was what it was, you know. That was, it wasn't for us. It wasn't for us. You look at the penalties as well. You know, all their penalties were great penalties, weren't they? Did you see Chris Makin's penalty, by the way? Horrendous penalty. Have a look at it. Absolutely. But he does Terrible. this boxing move at the end. I don't know. Yeah, don't Yeah. Just span into the net and he had a little flip then with a little boxing routine, what he did. Have a look at it. If I remember rightly, you were the first one up for us, weren't you? You took the yeah. first one. What goes through yeah. your head when you're walking through what was then old Wembley? You've got 90 odd thousand fans. I mean, it, it was scorching that day. By that point, we were all absolutely knackered as fans, as players, as coaches. You step up to take the first penalty. There must have been a part of you that was absolutely shitting yourself. Yeah, but you know what I did is I just put it, what I thought to myself, 
I thought, well, I can't go up there and side foot it and the keeper saves it. I said, I've got to hit this ball, right? I've got to hit it and that's it. If he saves it, look, that's the way it goes. No problem at all. And the weird thing is, is when it's because it, you only ever dream of playing professional football. When you're actually doing it, it's a little bit surreal sometimes. You're like, is it a joke or what? You know, because you, 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 you're doing it and it's what you dreamt of all your life. Then you're at Wembley. Then you're making that walk, what you've seen so many people do. And I thought the strangest thing is, when you put the ball down, I can hear the ball touch the grass, right? Now, you think, because of all the atmospheres, what is there and all that lot, you, you can't hear little things. That, when you're playing football, you can hear the breathing. You can, it's not like it's in the background. So it's not deafening. So you can, the little things are, and I put the ball down, and I could have been in my back garden. Just heard the ball, put down, I thought, what the, and just a little stupid, I go, I think stupid things. And as soon as you lift your head up, you think, hang on a minute, we're well, not in the back garden there, here we go. And I just put the ball down, I thought, right, this is what I'm going to do, I'm just going to hit it. And I'm going to be at the target with it. So it's the power, you know, and luckily I caught it sweet, it's really perfect. It came up, we just caught it perfectly there. And it, 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 listen, it could have gone horribly wrong. You think it's a 50 50, isn't it? But my thing was, if I'd have done what Mickey was, I'd be, I'd, I'd be thinking, what are you doing? You know, get some power on it. You know, make the keeper make a fantastic save. If he's got that's all I thought the way through it. And I just put, got my laces through it, tried to hit the centre of the goal and it lifted and it just caught it perfectly. And that was me out of the way then. Once you score that goal, then you're all right then. So nice little run back then. You can take your time a little bit, kiss the badge up. You know, <laughs> it's all that adrenaline feeling, isn't it? You know? <laughs> Over to you, lads. <laughs> what was it like when you were, because I know Phillips and Clarkie had gone off. He probably would have been people who would have took the penalty. I think Phillips was our penalty taker at the time. Um, but I remember, I remember Danny Dicciu was on the uh, was on the pitch. And I, I've heard a few people say that when they were saying, like, who wants to take a penalty? And Dicciu was just like, I'm not taking one. I'm not taking it. Was there anyone else that was just not wanting it? No, he was at that time. He went, no, no, not, not for me. But I remember we came back in pre-season. We were playing somewhere, somewhere close in Durham or whatever like that. He said, I'll take this one. <laughs> we all went like that. What? Uh, even now, sometimes you, you know, sometimes you don't feel that, that that way, and he didn't. You know, I know he'd say, well, he's a centre forward though, but no, nah, he was he was a great player, Deech. But that's what he felt at the time. You know, I don't think when it came to Mickey, Mickey never thought he was going to come that far. He thought he was going to be all over and all done and dusted. All of a sudden, as it's going on, you know, you're thinking, well, come on, it's going to get finished now, and then it gets closer. And if you're not really, that's why with me, it's a lot easier because it's me. I'm first. I'm out of the way. I couldn't think of anything worse than being third, fourth, fifth down the line. All of a sudden, these guys are doing. That's what and you're thinking and you're looking and your mind and you're changing your mind and. But, for me, it was quick. It was first penalty. There you go. That was me out of the way then. But these other ones, it's you know, it's proper. It's nervous. It's because you think what's at stake there, and you think about the fans and what everything about it. That's all in your mind. That's and, and you you're getting a chance to think about it. A lot of the stuff when you're playing football is you're doing it off the cuff. It's natural to you to sit there and go, hang on, what I'm going to do? Left, right? Where's the keeper going? What about if you're thinking, well, I'll put it in the right hand corner. And the keeper makes a save to the right-hand corner. It's be a lot more nervous for the other guys. And talk about Dicho as well. I mean, obviously people look at him and go, oh, why didn't he take a penalty? And there's a couple of people that have that opinion. But with, with Dicho, he was a great character as well, wasn't he? Was he a DJ or something like that? He used to be like a house DJ yeah. or something. Me- Mellow D, I think he was called. Oh, he was brilliant. Yeah, because he was obviously down in London. And that was what he did. I remember going, I remember going to the Purple Onion or something once in Middlesbrough with him. And he just put the set up and he was DJing. And that was his game. I think he lives over in Canada now. I think he's, he, yeah, he's doing something over there. So you've got to realise a big part of that uh, of that season there, Kevin Phillips got injured. That was why the squad, what we had, you know, you've got to have it. If you if you miss key players out, you've got to have players what can come in and do a job. And he was definitely that. He was he was an established Premier League player. Yeah, plus was, uh, Premier League DJ. But I remember going for autographs as a kid, and he used to always have like his music was absolutely booming whenever he used to come out in this big like Land Rover, and it was like bouncing. You know, he was, he was the music man, but yeah, he was, I'm great to see him do, man. I think he's doing coaching as well now, isn't he? So. Talking about um, your time at Sunderland and stuff like that, I think one thing that sticks out in my mind loads, and he did it a few times, but it was probably the first time I remember it happening. Ben Thatcher, knocking you for what, absolute six, that photo, you know what it is with a photo when you look at it, it's, it's quite sickening, but did you ever speak to Ben Thatcher about that? Has that ever come up in conversation between, has he ever actually apologised for trying to take your head off and decapitate you? No, nah, it was. Uh, I think I saw him in somewhere in London once, or whatever. No, it was. It, uh, I mean, Boldy, Boldy. It was. It was at Wimbledon away. I think yeah. it was. Yeah, it was Wimbledon away. Yeah, and yeah, he it was. Just, if you look at the ball, what 
bowl he laid in for me was perfect. It was right in between. He came in. You know, the way I look at it is, I mean, I used to give it out. I used to wind people up. That was my, I loved doing that. You know, and out of all the career what I had, that was my only thing. I never broke anything. You know, that was that was someone just get, getting that was having their time with me. It's not a problem. I used to do loads of stuff to other people, and that was what it was. I didn't break anything. I didn't break any legs or anything like that. I played the following week after that, but that was my that was my talking when I should have been listening. Well, and that was hey, you calm down a little bit, and that's what happens. You get that, you know. And I, I don't. I, I think the worst one was the one when he caught the boy from Portsmouth at, at, at City and knocked him Edward out. Mendes. That yeah, that yeah. was that was a little bit. Nasty, but mine looked looked worse, and it was bad. But you know that was that was the game. That you know I used to I was verbally I used to love that. I used to cook all them everywhere. I used to go, get stuck into everyone, and that was my little bit of a hey, calm yourself down a little bit. And, you know that's what it was. If that's all out of my career, is that there? You know, it, it's no serious injuries. You know, and that was it. So, but you do get that in football. You've got to, you've got to protect yourself. But if you do get a little bit out of your station, just sometimes it can happen. <laughs> With GBH, I think you've took it quite well there, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> yeah, but, they went, but the thing is there, the referee never gave a foul. No, didn't get booked for it. Well, they went down the other end and scored. Yeah, so I they did. Like, I, was, I, was, I was like, Who's, what, what are we doing? Where are we going here now? <laughs> Chris was like, yeah, but you ask all them, Chris is laughing. Chris always laughs his head off. Oh, he's like, I said, but, the, but what was going on? <laughs> they just start laughing. Down. It was just that, yeah, it was a little bit of a wake up call, though. But hey, that's football. In terms of your son and career after that, I think, kind of unfortunately, and unbeknown to lots of the fans, it kind of started coming to a bit of an end at that point. Now, there was a lot of talk about the Melanie Sykes incident, and I think, you know, it is what it is. That's just life. It, and we talked about um, media and stuff before, and it just it is what it is young footballers, TV presenters, whatever. Um, but you actually still played after that, whereas Chris maybe didn't, and Mickey Gray continued to play as well. But you played up until the end of the season. I think you, you got dropped one game against Leeds. We got beat. You came back in against Newcastle. I think so did Chris, actually. But then he got sold in the March. I think that was the back end of January. But come the end of the season, Reedy just ignores you for six months. Did he ever give you a reason of why he did that? No, what, what, he, what he did was uh, he obviously must have thought the time's up with me. That's what he must have thought that. Uh, I've I'm I'm finished the season off, as you said. I think, well, no problem. For me, it could not get any better for me. You know, I want to take it to the next level after that. So I start just a couple of days in pre-season, one day or something. Uh, and he comes up to me and he says, we've agreed a deal with, with, with Bradford City that you're going to go there. And I wasn't going to ask, no, don't, don't want to. No disrespect to Bradford, who I later on went on and played for. But no, this is where I want to, I want to stay here. And I was training them with the youth team. They went away on pre-season tour. Uh, spat my dummy out, obviously, because I'm not just, like I said, it's all egos. What am I doing here? Why has it gone horribly wrong? Turning up, playing in pre-season games, just doing the basics, really. All the rest of the lads are away in, in Portugal, playing Porto and the likes of that. It gets, it gets to just three days or two days before the Arsenal game or the opening game. And Peter Reid comes up to me and says, look, you're playing on Saturday. And I just had not done a pre-season, had not played. You know, I would have been awful. Should I have played? Should I have got on with it? Looking back, maybe. But I, I, I was, I, I really tossed it off in the, in the, in, in the pre-season. And you have to, to go and play a Premier League game against Arsenal, you have to be, you have to have games under your belt. You've got to be fit. Otherwise, you, you'd have been laughing even more. You'd have been talking about how bad you were on that game. And that would have given an excuse then possibly to get rid of me. So I said I wasn't up for it. And that was put in that I turned around to I didn't want to play for some of them. Well that was not that was never the case. Why would I do that? You know, and it just went horribly wrong from there. Uh, I was totally not involved with any training at all. Not involved with a youth team. It was training on my own. I eventually went down to Manchester, said I'll train there. So I'm totally out of it, which I don't think was possibly a good move by me. And uh, eventually got a move to Bolton but the, the the exit was just from me thinking no this is this this is it I'm enjoying my football and then just going horribly wrong and then going to another football club where you've got to show the fans you've got to you know you're in the division below and it was uh, it was straight back to where we were really leaving City or all, all that type of stuff it just went horribly wrong I couldn't get that form back again uh, and it was it was a disaster. But to leave it like it was, I used to listen to the three guys: uh, McDonald, Eric Gates, and I forget the other guy from Middlesbrough. And I, 
Yeah, and as I'm driving down, it was just they, they, they just said, look, we've got to stop talking about Nick Summerby. We can't answer your questions. And I was in the car just driving, just thinking, well, this has gone awful, this, and running around trying to keep myself fit. And, you know, just a, just a nightmare from what could have been could have been sorted out surely it could have been for what for what for not going to Bradford I don't know that was my choice that you know but surely I think deep down Peter Reid wanted me out of the football club wanted Chris out of the football club and you know it always leaves you a little bit you know because you do you look back at certain situations yeah. and I'm just great and, and thankful that Bob Murray did his interview and came out with some home truths in the interview you know I think that was for, for me I thought you thank you I'm not going crackers it wasn't me and, and, he, and he spoke the truth you know, there was more life in me, more life in Chris, more life in a lot of those players. And I just thought, I thought they got rid of too many of them there. And it ruined it, you know, it just it ruined it. They weren't replacing players with better players, were they? <laughs> no, um, for, for, I would like to expand on that, but the, the short answer is no. Yeah, you're right. With, with Reedy then, I mean, obviously Reedy's not in the management game and hasn't been for quite a while now. But have you spoke to him since then or did that kind of sour your relationship? I don't think we'll be best mates. Never will be. That's, he's not my type of person and vice versa. But we do see each other. I'll go over and say hello and blah, blah, blah. And he'll say, how are you doing? And, and, and that's it then, really. Yeah, I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it being that way. As long as we say hello, how are you doing? Good, that's it. No problem. But, yeah. you know, we, we gave a lot back as well. Peter Reid and Bobby Saxton, you know, they, 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 in, their, in their unique styles, was successful. And the team did that as well. You know, hence the reason. If you look, you know, he, he never went on Peter Reid and was a successful manager after that. Everything was there; it all worked, it all gels. Everyone plays a part in that success. You know, everybody. So I don't think anybody in particular takes that one. Uh, you know that what you know that's me. That's not. It was everybody gelled. Everybody believed in what was there, and, and, and that was it. But I look at a lot. I mean, I've not ever seen Kevin Phillips or anyone like that. You know, and it's as wonderful goal scorers and all that, but. There's work before that, you know, there's crosses, there's a defending, you know, they're the ones that do the most difficult thing by putting the ball into the net. And he did a, He did his favourite 1-11 to 11, and he, he put me in it. He said, look, you can have your Beckham's He said he was a fantastic crosser. I needed that when I was up there, you know, just someone to say, hey, hang on a minute. He, he's all right, him. You know, I would have liked possibly a little bit of that with that team spirit. He said, hang on, he's put a few balls in, you know, would have been nice. Not just, Dan Quinney, whatever like that, you know, and it just was horribly wrong. And you know, would I have done that? It's a difficult one, but you would have thought they would have, you know, because yeah. you know we're putting the service in, we're we're doing that. You know, Chris, uh, Mickey, Jono, uh, Schwartz when he came, all this is part and parcel. That that that's what gels that, you know. Do you think there was an element of fear that maybe they didn't do it in case the same happened to them? Because there was a there's definitely a perception. And there's a lot of evidence towards it that if you got on the wrong side of Reedy, that was it. You've got Johnson, Bridges, Clarkey, you, Chris yeah. Macon. Well, I, think, I, yeah, but I don't think I don't think you're two centre forwards. You know, they, they they're too important. You know, if they just yeah. said, it, it, it would have been just a little bit. You know, and the re- relationship what Quinny had with with Peter would have been that would have been a nice little thing. But hey, you know, it's you look after yourself when you when you when you're playing football. That's you know that's what you that's what you do when you're in there. You know, and I take fond memories. I don't. I don't take any. Do I? Do I feel? Do I feel bad about it? No, not at all. It's that's what it was. I had great times when I was there. I played my best football, and I look back at some them very fondly. You know, I caught it at the right time. You know, that's why when I watch this Netflix thing now, and I look at a football club, which is it, 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 it's a fantastic. The two episodes are amazing. You know, but you look at a club now, which is. A few people have, have disrespected it and a few people have, have had a good time out of it. But when, you, when you're a part of it and you, and you, th- you know, and I only, I only know good times, you know, and I'm going to play football in the North East and playing in Sunderland is, is absolutely something special and the, and the passion and they, and they know the football, know their football. They turn up, they turn up because they turn up because they like the basic things in football, hard working. If you try and you give give everything you've got, they will come. They will keep coming. You will get. You will. They will. They will sell the place out if you if you give them just that little enthusiasm. If you don't do that, they won't come. You know, very very football minded uh, fans. They know their stuff, but they don't ask a lot. Just give them give them that passion and give them that, and they'll come all day long for you. One 
funny moment I actually remember from what would have been a difficult sort of last year, last six months of that season. I remember you, I think you made you train with the kids for a bit, but he put you in for a reserve game against Newcastle. And obviously he frustrated at that point. Obviously quite annoyed that you're not in the team and you're playing in a reserve side. But I remember you, you took it out on Andy Griffin and you walloped him one. <laughs> and like... <laughs> <laughs> stuck him, <laughs> stuck him in touch. What's your, what's your memories of absolutely nailing Andy Griffin in a reserve game? <laughs> no, but I used, I used to be gangly with my arms. You see, that was my thing. I could always yeah. catch people a little bit. You know, that's what I was. I had a funny. Uh, I mean, Bolt, uh, Boltneck, who I call Boltneck, is is Paul Butler because he looks like Frankenstein, doesn't he? So he used to be turkey. <laughs> he used to call me turkey neck as a way of run. It still does now. Turkey neck, he calls me. So blah blah blah. So. He just used to, he, I just used to protect myself. And I, if the fullbacks came sometimes, I could just catch him. When I'm talking, when you're asking me before about the Ben Thatcher thing, I did a lot of that with, 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 with defenders. I can get away with it. I knew how to do a little bit. I used to push the ball on the outside sometimes and I could just catch them. You know, this particular time, things not going right football wise, playing in this game. And he was trying to kick me a little bit. So that was it, wasn't he? He just said, he had to, <laughs> I think I got taken off straight away after that. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't did. an hard man, but you had to protect yourself in certain ways. And there was a lot of, because uh, things weren't going so well, it, there was a lot of that then. I don't, think I, pl- I don't think I played possibly again after that. No, I think I, that was the last time you officially played in a, a Sunderland shirt anyway. As it was, you, you went on to have a, a few years after that. And I think you were quite honest in the fact that you said probably your best time was at Sunderland. And it almost felt like that last year unsettled you to the point where, you went to Bolton and probably there was a part of you that thought, you know, I should be at Sunderland because many of the fans felt the same way. But as it was, you went to Bolton, Leicester, Forest. But I think when you went to Bradford, which you eventually went to, I think it was, I had like four caretaker managers or something and Robson was yeah. there and it was just all, all a bit mad. Um, as it was, I think Bradford were going through that period where they were just dropping and dropping. I think they went from Premiership, Division 1, Division 2. I think they went quite far down. But for you personally, when did you know it was the right time to, to hang your boots up and say, like, look, I've lost the enjoyment of it here? For me, with those stories, uh, I mean, I, when I didn't do the pre-season with Sunderland, I possibly didn't, out of all the next six, seven years, I possibly did one pre-season out of all that. Now, if you're a professional footballer, it's impossible. You cannot, you know, and you lose the sharpness, you lose everything. It's so important to do a pre-season, you know, and I just never did the pre-season because I was trying to find football clubs. I was changing football clubs. I was joining football clubs after, after. Uh, I mean, you look at Leicester City, you go to Leicester. I went to Forest to play for free. Uh, couldn't get a couldn't get any couldn't get a club. Uh, went to went to all the went to Leicester. They were in administration at the time, uh, so we started off the first six months not getting paid. Uh, eventually managed to get up that 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 year, but didn't give us anything. And I just couldn't get it. I couldn't I couldn't get it. And then you fall out of love with it, and then other players overtake you. You know, you're you're a season out of of the Premier League or or any of the any of the leagues there. You're on catch up, and these young players come in, they, and it's difficult to get it back. And I never got my fitness, and I never really got to the levels, and I went a little bit downhearted with it. Really, I mean, all the lads who Chris was playing Premier League, Mickey was all Premier. League, every all those players were still up there having it, you know. And it was just went horribly wrong for me. So. I got as much out of it as I could to try and keep earning money. I think I finished, fin- I finished at Tamworth. That's how bad it was there with me. And Paul Merson came to play there. It only lasted three weeks there, and you know, and it was, I was just, it came to the end. Then it was just the, my my boots were in the back of the car. Whoever said go and play, I just went and played, but I couldn't. You know, I couldn't, there wasn't any quality really with it. I suppose final question because it's something that we've discussed um, probably quite a bit off off air sort of over the years. Um, times are, are difficult at Sunderland and I think almost because of the coronavirus and stuff like that we've kind of forgot ha- the fact that we're probably facing a, a third season in League One which is not where Sunderland should be but say you were in charge at Sunderland you know what would you change and so what are your thoughts on the current situation at Sunderland? I, I just think you've got to be honest with the, with the fans like properly honest tell them tell them what the situation is financially you know, I think it's very difficult to blame the young players. You know, the, the, these young players have to be have to be have to be coached, have to be taught, have to have to step up. But don't put so much pressure on them, saying you have to get up this year. 
you know you've got to you can't say that you've got to just hopefully you've got to try and get it going so hopefully it does happen don't put pressure on these players you've got to help them you know and it's got to be run right this football club now how this football club is run now is going to impact on impact on it in, in in four to five years you know and you've got to get it right get these youth players coming in and hope by the way hopefully one day someone comes in and buys it you know it's not about the music changing the music going out not about that it's about what those players do do you understand what i mean there's no good going to a pub meeting or because you the passion is the passion and it always will be there get the football get those players right but first and foremost you tell the fans the truth tell them where you are if you if you're running a, a, a 25 million pound loss a year right this is what be honest with them just tell them don't blow you know i look at little details there I get the one what they did where, where you've got to tidy the ground up because it went down a little bit. Little details like that. When you're walking around as well and you've got, a, you've got a sprayed sign of Newcastle, get it off straight away. Get everything all tidied up and sorted out there and get it all work. I mean, you, there's no easy way and work hard at it. Work hard at it and, and, and hopefully it turns itself around. You would think somewhere along the way that somebody would come in with, with, with some money because it's that much of a good offer. But because they're in so much of financial ruin, Whoever whoever's looked after the football club, there is. I mean, how could you be? How could you have a, a wage budget of 36, 37 million pounds? It's just ludicrous, ludicrous, you know. But it has to be addressed, and the fans need to be told, and and told straight away. It's going to be a kick in the balls for them. But there's no one more who will back the club that, that more than ever. Can't have a couple of fellas in there just thinking, "My God, a minute, it will turn around straight away." It's not just like that. Doesn't football is not like that. Get on that training ground, get it all worked out there, get all these young players and get them all going. You know, the lad who went on to Bordeaux should have never left to go to Bordeaux. Should have never done it, whatever. You know, you spent three and a half million straight away after it. Have you not got, surely when you know he's out of contract, you, have you not got anything in place of that? You've got to think of that. You know, there's, there's so many little things there which have got to be sorted out and it, you get that side of it sorted out. And I'll tell you what else I saw as well. There was a pre season and the players walked in and there was no zip to it. How are you doing? All right. What do you do? Have a bit of fun. Get that dressing room going. Get in there. Get a bit of fun. That's what we had. You know, get that team together. Look to them. They walked in first day. Straight away, I'd have gone, get yourself home. Come back tomorrow, will you? And come back with a smile on your face and have a little bit of a go. You know, because that grows, doesn't it? Yeah. I looked at the players and thought, bloody hell, lads, come on. Get your, what's up? You're playing at Sunday there. Get, get into it. And as somehow or other, it turns around. Things turn around. It's too much of a good proposition, but do the right thing. I hate it. I loved it, by the way, the Netflix programme, but I don't think there's enough truth being told there. I don't think. I mean, Mickey Gray did put, put, put something out that he, he'd done a two-hour interview. Mickey Gray is a Sunderland fan. He's a Castletown lad. He can throw a stone from where he lives to the ground. You know, listen to these people. You know, he was successful there. Give him something. Listen to these people and, and everyone pushes together and gets it going. I thought it was fantastic. It was upsetting. But, but it's, it shows you about a football club there. It shows, you about a, it shows you about an area which has so much passion for football. You know, and it'll turn. It will do. It all turns. And that's what football's all about. Hopefully. It will do. But if you think, no, it will do. No, but you can't. It will do. Because the Summer fans will get, the summer fans will get behind them all the way. It's all that stuff in the background. Too much, there's some people there who have had a big drink out of this, you know, and they're the ones you've got to sieve them out. And they, you know, so like turning up with big Range Rovers and showing us eight bedroom houses and all that's no good. That not interested in that, you know, it's about that football club, that's what it's all about. Nicky, thanks very much, mate. Appreciate it. Now, anytime now, I look forward to seeing you a lot in 2022 when the World Cup comes. You're gonna buy my flight, we'll be out here. We'll be out. <laughs> 